So I'll be talking about flooding through a case study of the 2011 Thai floods, uh, which, as, as you all know, is the worst that Thailand experienced uh, for, for in many decades. While nature and climate change were certainly two of the causes, there are also societal causes. These, there, these include water management, land use change, the filling of canals, and heavy construction in floodplains and wetlands. Therefore, this, the responses must not only be technical, but also political and societal. So I also argued the sources of uneven vulnerabilities of populations to the floods were societal. During these floods, some people stayed dry at the expense of others. This also raises questions of justice. I follow the approach of political ecology, which views environmental change and ecological conditions as outcomes of political processes. They also view cities as landscapes of powers. It raises the question of how power determines who gains access to resources in the cities. Also, the state is a crucial actor because it is the one who normally invests in flood risk reduction. And in many countries today throughout the world, the elite have been able to use the state to protect themselves at the expense of others. And one last point is disasters such as floods are seen not as natural, so we reject the, the, the term natural disaster. So where floods occur, who they affect and their magnitude are a result of political and socioeconomic processes. One big issue was there's massive land use change. This occurred especially during the last few decades as the country transformed from agricultural-based to export-led economy. Also, canals were filled in by developers to build new buildings and roads. This means there's less runoff for flood water. Concretization is, decreases water infiltration, increases runoff, and therefore hastens it into channels. Since the 1970s, the city's ground has sunk more than one meter. And this is due primarily to excessive groundwater pumping by industries. Another big issue is that the development has been uh, driven by market forces rather than by state planners. Until 1992, Bangkok was the largest city in the world when, without official development plan. And until the last few years or so, it's been poorly enforced. Another issue is though it's been also very unequal development, especially in terms of flood risk. The most powerful and those who work often live in the, in the inner cities, uh, but the poorest often live near canal. Bangkok has the least amount of green space per capita in all of Asia. And so this means there's nowhere for, for water to be stored or, or just, you know, to, to be retained when it does flood. Okay, so now to move to 2011. The first cause is yes, there was a lot of rain, but there was just as much rain and, and years passed. So as I argued about, there's many non-natural factors, our human actions, social actions. Besides the environmental changes I talked about before, um, it was also how water was managed upstream. So as a result, 17 water gates broke. It shows how big the breach was. And the other big issue was the management of, of the two major dams upstream. Puatai at the time also instructed the dam managers to, to protect farmers. They didn't open the dam as much as they could have. So as a result, this added 17% amount of water downstream. And then later it, it hit the industrial states in Ayutthaya. This is where Honda, Canon, many other major companies produce goods. So briefly talk about as the water reached Bangkok itself. The government erected huge sandbag barriers and closed water gates, first to protect the boundaries of Bangkok. But then this was breached, as I talked about, that dike was breached in two areas. But also, and so then they decided to protect the inner city. So the problem was those outside the, the sandbags and, the, and those on the other side of the water gate, they felt forgotten. Many people felt a high degree of injustice. And so there were dozens of protests during the time. This is, this is showed the map of the flooding. Uh, this shows how uh, Nantabri, Batum, Tani were so badly flooded. And in the inner area was not flooded. To go back, uh, there's also an issue of lack of cooperation and communication. Uh, the, the governor and the prime minister from different parties, they also had different priorities, understandably. The, the National Housing Administration did a study saying that they found that 20% of people in Bangkok were affected. I think this number is much higher. But also, I just wanted to highlight that 70, they found that 73% of low-income people were affected. And I think this is because, as I mentioned, that they live in the, the areas that were, that were flooded in the north and northeast, but also because Within each district, they live in the lowest lying land. They live near the canal, and also they have the lowest quality of housing, so they cannot withstand flooding very long. So briefly to conclude, I argue that floods rather read, are caused by social environmental causes. Most powerful groups have profited from changes to the environment, urban environment. State practices before and during 2011 contributed to the floods. And since then, the status quo has basically been achieved. So if you talk about the idea of resilience of bouncing back, it's been basically back to the previous state, which, which you could argue, some would argue, is bad resilience. And it's created new uneven vulnerabilities. One person's resilience might make be another person's subjugation. So I argue we need to focus on building resilience of the, of the least resilient. So this includes the urban poor, small medium uh, enterprises, which are badly affected, and, now, and also smallholder farmers. <laughs>